First, I'd like to thank everyone for coming this morning to our Hemlock Lily Adelgid Volunteer Survey Training. Um, we are putting this training on as a partnership between Western New York PRISM, which is a partnership for regional invasive species management, Cornell University Cooperative Extension, Erie County Parks, and New York State Hemlock Initiative. So thank you for spending this beautiful Saturday morning with us. And I just want to give you a rundown of our agenda today. We are going to do introductions. I am Cecilia Persian from um, West New York PRISM. I'm the Education and Outreach Program Manager. And also with me from PRISM is Brittany Hernan. She is our Terrestrial Program Manager. Uh, our next presentation will be by Carrie Marshner. She's going to give us the Hemlock Willie Adelgid identification, Hemlock biology, and survey methods. And then we're going to have an IMAP Invasives tutorial by Brittany Hernan. And then we're going to have our 10 Essentials to Winter Hiking Safety with Ranger Nikki. And then we'll have uh, some time to do uh, question and answers. So uh, we've got a really great program for you guys today. And again, thank you for coming. All right. So Brittany is going to give, give us a quick um, rundown of what an invasive species is. Yeah, so I thought before we um, dive into the training, I just wanted to give a you know general definition of invasive species in case anyone isn't familiar with, with them. So an invasive species is a species that is not native to the ecosystem and also one that um, causes harm to the economy, environment, or human health when it's introduced to that ecosystem. And so I just wanted to go over some examples. So it may impact the economy, um, certain forest pests that we've been, you know, that have kind of been in the news, like the spotted lanternfly, um, things that might impact agricultural crops and cause some type of economic hit. Um, or it could be something that, you know, grows um, throughout a water body and people can no longer swim, boat, fish, anything like that. And it could impact recreation or tourism. Um, and then uh, the environment, so something that grows in an area and it may um, spread out and decrease the native species present in the area and maybe remove them altogether. So it affects the biodiversity, it affects the, you know, the species that are naturally supposed to be in that area. Um, and then they can also impact human health. So one of the big ones that is kind of characteristic for this is giant hogweed. So this is a plant that if you get the sap on you and then you're exposed to the sun, it causes these very painful giant blisters on your skin. Um, but in most cases, invasive species impact all three of these. They impact the economy, the environment, um, and human health. So again, just wanted to give a little background. And now I will turn it over to Carrie, who will focus on our uh, featured invasive species for this presentation. Hi, can you see and hear well? Okay. Um, thank you guys for having the New York State Hemlock Initiative join your training. Um, my name is Carrie Marshner. I'm the outreach coordinator for the New York State Hemlock Initiative. We are a lab at Cornell University. And most of what we do is research for um, developing a biocontrol solution for hemlock woolly adelgid, but we also help with um, hemlock conservation around the state with information and support. And I want to thank CC Erie County and Western New York Prison and our funders who make it possible for me to come provide this information. Hemlock trees are really important. They're what's called a foundation species. That means that um, they're very abundant and they essentially create an ecosystem that other animals use. Um, they're important because they're our only shade adapted evergreen tree. So um, they're, they're evolved to grow down, to grow in mature forest, so they can grow in very low light, um, which makes them pretty unique. And because of this, they often grow in our gorges, on north facing slopes, in other places where other trees um, do not thrive as well. They support about 400 species. Um, aquatic and terrestrial. And they're also habitat for those species. And if you walk into a hemlock grove, 
in the summer, you'll notice that it's significantly cooler under the hemlocks than it is in the rest of the woods. And the air under the hemlocks is about 10 degrees centigrade cooler than the air above the canopy. Um, and then in the winter, if you walk into a hemlock grove, the wind drops because they have um, pretty, good, pretty good canopy coverage fairly low down um, and because they're evergreen. And it's a little bit warmer as a result under the hemlocks. So they provide refuge year round. They also provide good ecosystem services um, for not just the ones that I just discussed, but also for aquatic ecosystems. Because hemlocks are evergreen, they're more active in the spring and in the fall, and they're less active in the summer when the deciduous trees are growing and pulling water out of the ecosystem, which means that having those hemlocks on the landscape this helps spread out the, the time that the trees are pulling water out of the ground. And that actually helps stabilize stream flows because the hemlocks are active in the spring and the fall when we have an overabundance of water and they're not as active in the summer when we often have droughts. And so watersheds that have hemlocks in them have a pretty different hydrology. Um, they, they are less flashy, which means that their, their um, stream flows fluctuate less over the year. And they also are cooler because the hemlocks keep snow under them longer into the spring, which provides cold water going into the, into the streams later into the spring. And they also provide shade all year round. So they're, um, as a result, they're often um, associated with cold water ecosystems. So actually another name for brook trout is hemlock trout. And there was a study done in the Delaware Water Gap where they found that the trout were three times more abundant in, in watersheds that have hemlock. So those are some reasons that hemlocks are really important. And I also want to mention in passing that over three quarters of New York's hemlock or forests generally are on private land. So it's really important for us to work with private landowners because what private landowners decide to do is makes a big difference to what the forests of New York are going to look like. They're actually the fourth most common tree in New York um, as of fairly recently. But this is a map that shows you where hemlock are generally. It looks like there's nothing up here in the lake plain, but there's actually a fringe of hemlock right on the lake, um, especially in Rochester. And then they're in the slot gorges and ravines all in this area. Uh, it just doesn't show up in the model that made this map, probably because the ravines are so narrow. And this is what we don't want our forests to look like with all of these gray ghost trees. Uh, this is Pisgah National Forest. Um, this is in the, the south of us. And um, in the south, H, the pest I'm going to talk about moves much faster. And for instance, in the Great Smoky Mountain National Park, they're working very hard to preserve just 1% of their Um, so this is the pest, hemlock woolly adelgid. It's an invasive pest. And to step back and talk a little bit about why this is an issue, these are the places where HWA is native. The colored blobs are where there are hemlocks in the world, uh, mostly Asia and North America. And the big green circles are where HWA, hemlock woolly adelgid, is native. So the species that live in these areas are um, the ecosystems there have been structured so that the HWA is not a significant pest. We're just the lucky ones that didn't have a piercing sucking pest like this. Um, and we don't have any predators that eat them and our trees are not well adapted to them. So here's where HWA is in New York, started down in the city started moving northwards, although, and then spreading west into the Finger Lakes and then north into the Adirondacks. This has grown a lot in the last few years, this Lake George station. 
And these two infestations, um, Buffalo and Rochester, are actually older than the Finger Lakes infestations because they were started by HWA that came in on ornamental trees, um, probably from nurseries in, in the mid-Atlantic where there was already HWA. So HWA looks like this, these woolly bundles on the twig of the tree at the base of the needles. Um, this is what they look like. Oh, look at that. Um, before, if you take off all of the wool and look at them under a scanning electron microscope, these little pores are where the wool is produced and this crazy child's straw-like structure here is its mouth parts. And that's what it puts down into the tree to suck starches out of the twig. And it's not actually the feeding that kills the trees. It's the tree's response to wall off the wound that's made by those mouth parts so that no infection will come in, which is fine if you have one or two of these. But if you have this many HWA, all of those, the scars that are left from walling off all of those teeny tiny wounds make it so that the tree can't get any sap out to the end of the twigs to make new needles. And, um, and so then they can't make new needles to replace the old needles. And when the old needles die um, of old age, then the, the tree starves and that's what kills the trees. In the south, they're dying in four to 10 years. In the north, when we have winters like this, that knocks back the HWA, a nice cold winter. And so our trees last longer because but the HWA populations build up and then they're knocked back by a winter, a cold winter, and then the, the trees have a chance to recover and then the HWA builds up again and then more damage occurs. So in, in our region, it's more like 10 to 20 years before our trees die, which is nice because it gives us more time to notice the infestation and notice the trees decline and do something to, to help them. HWA has a pretty complicated life cycle. In Asia, they actually have five generations um, working on two different host trees. Um, these winged females are important to three of those generations. But, you know, and in the, on the East Coast, we only have one of their trees, the hemlocks. Um, they don't have their other host trees. So they only have two generations. Um, and they are asexual reproducers. So they, one, one insect can start a new infestation. So this is the overwintering generation. They, their eggs are laid, where's my, there, there. Eggs are laid in the late spring. And then they go to maturity in the late winter. And then they lay eggs in the very early spring. And this generation matures much more quickly. And then they lay these eggs over here. This is what the crawlers look like, the little tiny HWA that have just hatched from their eggs. They're very, very small. Um, and they can be blown on the wind. They can crawl onto the feet of birds and be moved around that way. They can walk onto somebody's hands who's walking or drop onto somebody who's walking through the woods and move that way, maybe. But as you can see, they're, they're not a very robust creature. This is the only mobile phase of HWA. Once that little crawler puts its mouth parts into a, a twig, it can never move again. And if you dislodge it, it dies. And so April to June is the only time that you can really spread HWA. So the crawlers settle on twigs, put their little mouth parts in. And then in the summer, they essentially go to sleep all summer. Um, they, they're inactive. It's called estivation. If it were winter, we'd call it hibernation, but it's not winter, so it's estivation. Um, and then they wake up again in late September, early October. This is what they look like during that estivating period. They look like smaller than a poppy seed <laughs> uh, with a little white halo around them. And you can see that if you went out in the summertime 
and you weren't looking very, very closely, it would be hard to see these. And then once they wake up, they start feeding and growing and putting on this wool, which um, we think they're using to create a microclimate that protects them from cold temperatures and from desiccation. The, they look like this from November to June. But if you look up here, this is last year's wool. So if you go out in the woods any time of year, you can look for that kind of grotty old wool. And if your infestation is more than a year old, then you should be able to see that. The adults um, inside those little woolly bundles lay 50 to 100 of these little um, sort of earwaxy eggs. And so if you think about each one of those individuals laying 50 to 100 eggs and then two generations a year, that's a lot of insects. So I'm just gonna not worry about that. So asexual reproduction, one plant, one surviving insect can start a whole new infestation. Two generations a year, two opportunities for exponential growth and no predators eating them. Those three things are why we're having this real problem on the East Coast with very, very high mortality of our hemlock trees because the populations of HWA are out of control. That makes sense. How do you look for these guys? Um, we need as many people out looking for this small pest as we can possibly get. And this is a great example of why. Um, the APIP prism, capital prism, us, DEC, <laughs> all the Adirondack uh, people had been looking for HWA north of this find for four years, three years. This was found in 2017. We did surveys all around this area, 2018, 2019. And then a guy from Brooklyn was camping with his family up here. And he saw HWA in his, in his campsite. He said, that's weird. I have that at home in Brooklyn. I didn't think it was up here. I'm just going to record this in IMAP. And that was how we found this infestation that is now 250 acres that's being very actively managed to try to save some of these um, forests that are up to 60% hemlock in that area. And so the public reporting is really crucial for, for, for all invasive pests, but HWA is, is relatively easy to see and relatively easy to identify, and it's really important to get as many boots on the ground as we can to figure out where this pest is. So that's a good example of, there it is, the, the infestation that was found by a random public report. Now in Western New York, um, HWA has been here in Buffalo for a while, it's been in Rochester for a while, and it's been moving west from, from the Finger Lakes. Um, some of these reports are new as of this year. Um, and some of these reports are relatively recent as well. And this area, I think, is relatively recent. So there's definitely a lot of growth in HWA in Western New York. To explain this map, this is what IMAP looks like when you go to the website. Um, the little yellow hexagons are places where HWA has been found, and the little innocuously colored dots, whatever color that is, um, those are negative records. So mm. Allegheny State Park has been really heavily surveyed by the park staff. Mostly they've found negatives, but there's actually also positives in that area. Um, we, had a, we had a big survey effort by the folks who live right in this area and they found a bunch of negatives and now they're starting to find HWA in that area too. And so we have some areas where up here, there's probably not a lot of hemlock, but there are hemlock stands that we don't know what's going on in this whole area or this area. Um, but down here, it's a little more concerning that we have this sort of snake, big snaky area with no records because there's a lot of hemlock down here. 
and we'd really like to know what's going on. So if you're a landowner, we would encourage you to go out and figure out where the hemlocks are on your property, survey for HWA, um, and report, treat if you find anything. And also, if you can, let us know what you find. That would be really helpful. And can I just say that this last winter was in very mild. Um, and we saw the lowest mortality of HWA over the winter that we've ever recorded in the about seven years that we've been tracking HWA mortality. It was under 30%. Um, and so populations are absolutely booming this year. It's very easy to find infestations if they're there. And so this is really a prime year to go out and look for HWA. And we really encourage everyone to get out and survey their properties or survey in, on public lands. So if you're a community member, there are a few different opportunities you have to go out into the areas with hemlock trees, survey, and report um, to IMAP. You can also get engaged with a, a more um, involved survey team through us, the New York State Hemlock Initiative. Um, but I, I would encourage you to start with what Western New York is doing and, and then see if you want to keep going from there. So my final thoughts are that the winter temperatures um, are not really holding this pest in check. Um, we're getting more and more of these winters without the cold nights. And that's a good recipe for faster mortality for our hemlock trees and faster spread of HWA. Surveys and treatments are critical to keep the hemlocks that we have on the ground um, alive. And we're working very hard on, on developing a biocontrol that we can share someday. But not, not this year and not next year and not the year after that. With that, thank you. And um, I'm hoping that that Brittany is going to do IMAP. Uh, I just wanted to interject. Real quick. So I see that we um, have some questions in the chat and okay. we will answer those questions at the end at the question and answer. Um, right now we'll just move on to Brittany's presentation and we'll get back to you guys in a, in a little bit. Okay. All right, does this look good? Can everyone see it? Okay, so I just wanted to go over um, IMAP invasives a little more so that everybody can um, use this tool while you're outside and you'll be able to collect data. Uh, so to start, um, IMAP invasives is a, is a tool that we use to collect data on invasive species. And so it's an online, mobile-friendly, uh, GIS-based data management system. And it's used for tracking and monitoring invasive species. And as Carrie showed you, you know, it's a way to look at where invasive species are present in an area where they have been or they have not been detected. Um, so it's kind of cool. You could look at many different invasive species and you know what's present in your area, things to look for. Um, but uh, this is what we use to report hemlock woolly adelgid infestations, um, either if you find them or if you don't find it and you find perfectly healthy hemlock trees. Um, and so to begin, you need to create an IMAP Invasives account. And so to do this, you go to imapinvasives.org and then you just click on the login button at the top of the screen. And so then this will take you to um, this screen and you can follow the directions to sign up. Um, and it's pretty easy. You just you know, follow this box to sign up, enter your name, an email address, a password. Um, your jurisdiction will be New York State. And then when you fill all of that in, you hit the join button. And then um, I just want to mention, so the sign up process is done completely on the website. Um, and then you'll be able to make your account. And like I said, you can log in, you can view invasive species present in your area, present at maybe a park that you're going to hike at. You can see if someone has surveyed for hemlock woolly delgid already in the park that you're going to um, or what areas they've surveyed. So it's a really cool tool to look at invasive species in the area. 
Um, but then after you create this account, um, we want you to put the app on a phone or tablet. So this will allow you to then go out into the field and collect this information while you're hiking, while you're looking for hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, and so, you know, it's easy just to bring your phone with you, collect a bit of information um, while you're outside in the field. And so to do this, um, you just search for the IMAP Invasives mobile app um, and you look for this, um, for their icon, it just has the green leaf and the little insect on it. Um, I don't think there's many other things that pop up, but it's IMAP Invasives mobile. And then when you find it, you can just download it to your phone or to a tablet, something that you can bring out with you while you're hiking that's convenient and it's you know easy to collect the data. <clears throat> All right, so then once you download the app, and open it. Um, for the first time, you'll have to enter that email and password um, that you just created online at the IMAP Invasives website. Um, but then once you do that, you'll see this little home screen. In the top right, there's that add observation button. Um, and then in the top left, there's a little three line button that you can click and you can select preferences. And so this is something you want to do before you go out in the field. If you want to change any of the preferences, you can choose to display the species name, scientific or common, the picture quality, um, if you want photos saved to your phone as you take them, what type of map you want. So there's a bunch of different things to play around with. Um, so you can just change your preferences and hit save. But the important thing is to log on to the app and update the preferences at home while you're connected to Wi-Fi before you go out to survey. And so then um, when you're out surveying for hemlock woolly adelgid, you can open the app and now you'll be logged in, everything will be set and you are ready to collect the data. And so, um, so I just have a couple of examples. Um, I know it moves a little bit quickly, but my thought is just, you can watch it now and then you can go back and watch it again um, when you're actually putting the app on your phone and collecting data and things like that. Um, so, you open the app and you click that little green um, add observation button in the top right. Um, and this is for you to start collecting data. So for this first observation, you inspected a tree and you found hemlock woolly adelgid on it. So the first part is you wanna take a photo of the infestation. So you can either use your phone um, and you can click to use the photo, you can retake it, things like that. And it'll open right up on your phone or tablet, the camera on it. Or maybe you got really excited that you found the HWA um, and before you even open the app, you took a picture. And so in that case, you can also go to your um, photo library that's on the phone or the tablet. Um, and then after that, you need to click the species. Um, so whether you find a species or not, you need to put a species name in. And so you just scroll through, there's a long list of species, and then you'll get to hemlock woolly adelgid. And like I said, for this example, we found hemlock woolly adelgid. So you'll select species detected. And then the default, um, settings are for the app to record the date and your location. So all of that should be on there. And then you just hit save. Um, and then it will show up in the app. So it's pretty easy just to go over it again. Um, you really just need to take a photo, pick the species and select detected if you found it. And the date will automatically fill in. The GPS coordinates will automatically fill in and you hit save. And now you can look right on that home screen and you see, you know, what day you collected it what the species was, if it was detected. Um, and then kind of just to go through it again, for a second example, um, is if you did not detect um, hemlock woolly adelgid. So in this case, you're out and you're looking at the tree and you see you know, a perfectly healthy hemlock tree. There's no signs of the hemlock woolly adelgid on the branch. There's no signs of it on any branches on the ground, anything like that. Um, so I think it's useful to still take a photo of the healthy hemlock, um, just so we know that you saw it, that it looked healthy. Um, and then again, you scroll down for the species, you look for hemlock woolly adelgid. And then in this case, all you'll do is select species not detected. And again, the date automatically fills in, the GPS location fills in, and then you hit save. And now you can see, you know, both of them your home screen detected, not detect or detected, not detected um, with the pictures, the dates, everything like that. Um, and so not detected entries are really just as important as the 
HWA detected entries. Um, so this allows us to, you know, just show that somebody spent time searching for hemlock woolly delgid at that park and they didn't find it. You know, they took the time to look at the trees, um, look for the signs. Um, but it also shows, or it also helps us see um, how long hemlock woolly delgid has been in areas. So if it shows up in the future, like if next year somebody goes out and finds hemlock woolly delgid in a park, they can look back and see that in 2022, you entered a not detected entry there. And so that just shows that it's a new infestation. That's the first year they've been able to detect it. Um, but also it could help, you know, if you're going out to survey before you go out, you can open up IMAP on the website, take a look at the park to see if anyone else has surveyed there before. Um, but again, even if somebody surveyed last year and reported a not detected entry, if you're going to that park and you plan to hike there anyway, it's still a good idea to look because, you know, as Carrie said, it's spreading into our area. Last year was a mild winter, so it still makes sense to recheck the trees in spots that people have surveyed before. Um, um, so yeah, then you can just, you know, continue hiking, continue checking, inspecting the hemlocks, adding your detected, adding your not detected observations. Um, but then when you get back home, you wanna to remember to connect to the Wi-Fi, select all of the observations that you think are complete, and then um, hit upload selected. And then they will be reported to IMAP. Um, and so once they go into IMAP, it triggers alerts. So people can review the observations and confirm the identity. Um, and then this also allows um, us to look at the infestation and it helps guide management efforts um, as well. So I know there was a lot of information, but really my hope is that you can go back and watch this as you are making your IMAP Invasives account, as you're putting the app on your phone, um, things like that. And I just ask that if you are interested in participating in this project, if you could just send me an email when you have made your IMAP account, downloaded the app and successfully logged into the app. Um, and so this just helps us track who's out there collecting data. Um, so we know what to look for when these um, notifications come in. I mean, you can just send me an email, um, h-e-r-n-o-n-b-a at buffalostate.edu. Um, but also if you have any trouble um, with IMAP Invasives, creating the account, putting it on a phone or tablet, anything like that, um, please feel free to reach out. And the only thing that we suggest is that if you plan to attend the survey training at Chestnut Ridge uh, next Saturday on the 29th, if you try to get the account all set up and the app set up on a phone or a tablet so that you can collect data while you're out there with us. Carrie, did you have anything that you wanted to add? I actually am not sure if Brittany covered this or not, but um, one one record per stand is plenty. Um, okay. To give us, you don't have yes. to do a record for every tree that you survey, but yeah, you know, per stand, is it here or not? That's a good point. And we did, um, we listed a couple of parks that are bigger where there were only not detected entries, maybe at like the Northeast corner. So something like that, it might be helpful then to go if there's like a Southern stand or something. So like you said, if you see one's already been reported, maybe check the other part of the park or something like that. Great. All right. Thank you, Brittany. Um, Ranger Nikki is now going to give us our 10 essential winter hiking safety tips. <laughs> Sick. It's all set. All right, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Can hear me? All right. All right, so I'm Ranger Nikki. Um, I'm a park ranger for the Erie County Parks Department. Um, so I'm going to go over just like general things, especially because it's extra cold this year, um, just safety wise and for your own health and safety. Um, so these are going to go over the 10 essentials to begin. So the 10 essentials are usually something you want to keep with you or that are highly recommended to keep in like a backpack with you or on your person while you're out and about hiking or anything like that. And mind you, all of these rules go for winter, summer, all of the above. Um, so none of these have a particular order. Um, 
So my first one is going to be navigation. I always recommend a compass. Um, huge thing is I have a physical compass and my phone compass just in case because we all know technology is technology sometimes. So that's a huge thing of actual physical compass. It's a big help along, in the long run. Um, sometimes it's nice to have a map um, of a trail you're on or a topography map which shows the elevations. Um, but the biggest thing, especially when it comes to navigation is have a plan, know what you're hiking, know what you're gonna be doing that day, where you're gonna be, things like that. Having a plan is the biggest part of it. Um, water, we all know that's the biggest. Always, always, always have water, even bring extra, have an extra bottle in your car for when you get back, things like that. Water is your best friend. Uh, clothing is big. Um, you never know when it's going to rain or snow, especially here in Buffalo. Um, and insulation. So when it comes to winter, layers are a must. You can, I have at least three layers on at the moment as we speak. <laughs> um, just because I know it's cold out there and I'll be out there after this. So you can always take layers off. You can't add layers once you're out there. So that is a big number one. Uh, first aid, just even having a band-aids with you is huge. I've accidentally cut my hands on um, a rock if you fall, things like that. Just having those, some type of gauze. If you don't have it with you on your, on your person, definitely in your car is always a good idea to keep that with you. Uh, sun protection, this is mostly for the summertime, just because summer and heat and you will get tired. Um, so if you don't have water, that sun is going to beat down on you and tire, tire you out even faster. Um, same with winter. Sun might not be out as often, but even then you can burn with the sun just as quickly in the wintertime, if not faster. Uh, footwear is huge. Um, comfortable, waterproof. Um, if you have feet issues, some type of insert, anything to keep you comfortable hiking. Um, even if it's a short walk you want to protect your feet they are the only thing getting you anywhere unless you want to crawl um so footwear is a big must be comfortable with the shoes you're in ankle support everything like that same with socks don't want too tight of socks but you don't want too loose of socks so find that comfort that you have with your feet and with the shoes you want to buy nutrition um high density foods such as like nuts Granola, energy bars are always nice. So just keep in your pack, keep in your car. Um, and especially wintertime, you don't wanna, you don't wanna be eating a lot, but every once in a while you wanna do a quick snack. It's that burst of energy that's gonna help you out. Uh, illumination. Um, our biggest thing, we try not to let anyone be in the park after dark. We highly recommend not going in the park at dark um, or after the sun sets just for your own safety. Um, but sometimes it's nice just in case whether you have a small flashlight with you or um, a headlamp, um, just in case. Because like I said, with the phones and technology, if your phone's dead, there goes that flashlight. So it's nice to have an extra one just in case because you never know. Um, but yeah, we always try and recommend check timing. If you're going out closer to dusk, shorter, shorter hike, get out before it gets dark. So you're not gonna wanna get stuck out there. Personal items, for me, my personal items would include like tools. Um, I keep a multi-tool, like a knife in there, just in case. Um, some simple gear for yourself. Some people like to carry rope. Um, I carry binoculars because I'm a big birder. Um, just things that you wanna keep up with you um, for safety and things like that, but also for your pleasurable stuff. Um, and emergencies, your big thing. A lot, a lot of times you don't have to worry about this too much here, but noisemakers kind of know how to protect yourselves if you see animals. Remember, you are visiting this area, not, you don't own it. So the animals were here first. Um, so you just got to kind of give them their space, things like that. Um, and a huge thing, fully charged phone, because you never know how long it might be, but still. Um, and then my number one thing is always let someone know where you are, where you're going, how long you plan to be, 
what trail you're on, things like that. Um, because if you can't be reached, at least they, someone knows where you are. Um, so that's the main 10 essentials there, um, especially to keep in mind, they are, I hate to say it, but life and death sometimes. It's nice to know what's going to keep you alive longer. So moving on with more winter hiking safety and specifically for that, um, especially because we do have a very cold season this year so far. And the farmer's almanac said it's going to be the coldest winter. Um, a big thing is that that hiking info, definitely leave that with you um, or with somebody. So time, route, destination, um, that's a big, big thing. We, even as rangers, we let each other know where we're at at all times in our plan for the day. Um, another one is the layers. Layers is big. I'm going to be wearing at least four today because of the cold plus hat, everything like that. Cause I can, like I said before, can take them off. You can't put them back on. Um, so I'd rather be hot and strip layers than be out in the cold and have nothing extra. Um, a big one, especially for hiking, you wanna watch out for uh, snow pockets. So this can be kind of, you'll see this more often during thaws um, or, um, with if you're near like a creek or anything, just you never know. So just watch your footing. That's a big thing. Um, packed down snow, especially I've noticed from snowshoes, as that starts to melt, it starts to pocket itself, kind of become air bubbles underneath. So they break randomly. Um, so just keep that in mind while walking. Sometimes it's better just to grab or invest in some snowshoes. Um, another one I like to do is crampons. Things that just you stick on the bottom of your boot, give yourself that extra little bit of stability. Um, but that's a big one, you never know. Um, usually it's more of a thaw. Right now you're pretty, you should be okay. It's all very solid and frozen out there. Um, but later on in the winter time, it's very common. Um, even if it just falls just slightly, you could, you could twist an ankle just quickly like that. Um, and my biggest thing, do not trust ice. <laughs> I am prone to falling even when there is no snow. So when it comes to ice, it's never trustworthy, no matter what. It'll crack when you don't want it to, and it'll be slippery every time. So that's a big, do not trust that ice ever. Um, check that weather report before you leave. Um, Cause you know, we could have a blizzard. <laughs> Blizzards happen in the weirdest ways. Um, and even with rain, rain, wind, just the safety of it. Don't go out in 75 mile per hour winds. Highly don't recommend. Um, hiking in a group is always recommended because you just never know what would happen. It's more fun too, um, especially when it's cold out. You guys can go off of each other, look for things, especially when it comes to looking for this. Um, the HWA, kind of get like a second opinion. Sometimes it's very nice to be doing it together and just go off of each other. Like I said, wear the layers, um, watch your footing. An ice buildup is very common with the water or any kind of um, creek area or especially like here at Chestnut Ridge, maybe not on the side we'll be looking at for HWA, but um, anywhere near creeks or waterfalls with the shale, water just builds up because um, it's just seeping out of the cracks. Um, cornices, which is uh, another word for snow overhang. Um, this is on ridges, cliffs. So don't get too close to the edge. You don't know if it's actually solid ground or not. Um, so they're very common, especially throughout trails, especially well-traveled trails. And then, like I said, the eat and drink in small quantities cold uses up your energy a lot faster. Um, so you want to really start and make sure you bring those high energy foods um, and little bits of water at a time too. So you're not gonna be chugging up your water. You're going to just take small sips here and there. Um, so going on to clothing um, wise, like I said, layers, but another one I wanna say is woolen fleece, something sweat wicking. So that's just, it's not gonna hold your moisture. Um, you're gonna avoid cotton. Our, one of our favorite quotes here is cotton kills. 
um, cause it's going to hold in that moisture. Um, and really it's in the end, it's going to cause you to be wet, even if it's just sweat. And once that turns cold, you're going to be extra cold. Um, so wool, fleece, anything that can kind of, isn't going to absorb water. I definitely don't recommend jeans, usually some type of, uh, overall coverall. If you have snow pants always are helpful. Um, yeah, those quick dry pants. I know for me in our range of uniforms, our pants are this weird texture, but they are, they wick water so well. The water just flows off if we get wet. Um, so unless we're really soaking ourselves, um, we're staying pretty dry for the most part. Um, num number one, I'm a big proponent of this, socks. Um, too many layers of socks um, actually could start to cut off circulation and make your feet colder. Um, so getting good pairs of socks that are comfortable and warm is a must. Uh, the shoes, waterproof shoes and boots, um, you want to check those shoes and boots too. I know I am not good at this. I've got a few holes in my boots because they're used very often. So trying to keep those um, updated and um, kind of just newer, but not overly new because you don't want blisters, of course. Um, but that's going to protect your feet from the cold because the biggest thing um, you'll have first is your feet are going to get cold quick. Hats. I like to wear the earmuffs um, or the earmuff headbands, and then I put a hat on top of it um, because we lose heat from our heads. Those are going, we're just gonna lose heat like crazy from our heads. That's gonna cause us to get super cold. So, I mean, I my hair starts to freak out and it's very long, so I braid it often, so it's out of the way. And I just wear a lot of hat. Um, and same going back to those shoes and boots, snowshoes, are great in those crampons. I highly recommend having something like that, especially winter time when it's this cold and frozen out. Um, it's gonna give you that extra stability, extra safety in standing up and walking possibly on a hillside with, since that's where hemlocks are very pretty much common. Um, and then bring those extra socks, pants, shirts. You don't necessarily have to bring them in your backpack or with you on your person, but having them in the car so you could change them out once you're back is a lifesaver. So those are the main main winter clothing basics you can add and take away whatever you think is necessary for yourself. But the best, best way I could say it, the warmer you are to begin with, the warmer you'll stay. Um, and it'll just make the hike way more enjoyable. Um, getting lost, I've been there. <laughs> I'm a park ranger and I'm still, I still get lost. It happens. Um, and if you're on a trail, the number one thing, no matter where you are, is stop moving. Take a deep breath and think, look at your surroundings. Um, usually if your phone is able to work, which is not always a necessary number one thing because cell service is hit or miss sometimes. Um, examples of that would be Chestnut Ridge will be fine most of the time when it comes to cell service, but let's say you went to Hunter's Creek in, out um, in Colden area and out towards East Aurora. There is no service there. You will not have cell service. Um, same examples going out towards Springville, Sardinia um, and Erie County forestry lots. There is no service there. Um, so you just got to keep that in mind. That's why back in the 10 essentials, having a map a compass, something like that is a great, then you got numerous options and you're, you're protecting yourself in that aspect. Um, so stop moving, take a deep breath, things like that. Pay attention, what trail are you on? So for example, at Chestnut Ridge Park here, we have at least four or five trails that are marked. Um, so look at the trail, are you on our orange colored trail? So you got your orange trails, what number are you at? Each one should be numbered. Um, and we have, that is for us to be able to find you even faster. Um, are you on the right trail? Did you start on an orange trail and now all of a sudden you're on a blue trail? That just means you took a wrong turn somewhere. Um, 
So really you just got to pay attention. Um, I know we like to look around, but if you're on a marked trail, paying attention is a big thing. Um, I know another park we have, it's called Franklin Golf. For, uh, it's a forestry lot. It is undeveloped, but it's all trailblazed and each one has a different color and every number is there. Um, and that is awesome because it helps us be able to help you find your way out faster and get you to where you want to go faster. Um, so paying attention is a must. Do not rely on that GPS or your cell phone. Like I said, with electronics too, batteries run out faster in the cold. Cold eats those batteries up. Um, not necessarily just because of that, just because the cold doesn't, phones and cold don't go together. Um, so always keep that in mind. Just be prepared with that. And the number one thing, don't panic. Um, if you need to, you take a deep breath, you look around, you can check your map. Most of our, I always recommend taking a picture of the map or the trail you will be following. So you would be able to at least say, hey, I've got a map just in case. Where am I now? Where should I go next? Um, if you have a phone that's able, you could always call for assistance. Um, that is always recommended as well. So keep that in mind. I know an example, even here at Chestnut Ridge, I have people start at the Eternal Flame lot and end up on the other side of the park, almost three miles in the opposite direction because they weren't paying attention to the trailblazes and all of that and didn't stop to turn around. Um, so that is a big thing, especially if you're on a trail is just pay attention. Um, still can wander around, have your fun, but paying attention to where you are at all times, is, especially in the cold, a must. So preventing cold and wet feet. Um, went through a lot of this type of stuff already with shoes, your socks, um, but if you don't, a lot of things, I'm gonna get some gross stuff real quick, just so we can keep in mind how important it is to keep our feet not cold and as dry as possible. So sores and blisters, they're pretty common, um, even with brand new shoes, um, but they could be killer, especially if you're out hiking for a while. One little sore or a brush burn or a blister in the back of your ankle, next thing you know, you're not hiking for a couple of days. Um, a big thing, dampness equals bacteria breeding ground. Um, so hence the extra socks, you want to take off those wet socks as soon as you can. Um, the less time your feet spend being wet, the less chances of um, athlete's foot and things like that. You just don't want to do that to your feet. Uh, frostbite, the colder it is, the more prone you are to this. This is more specific for the toes a lot of times than the, the full foot. Um, but this could lead to permanent damage in the long run. Um, so just the idea of not spending too much time out there if you don't have to, warming up your feet as soon as you can, things like that um, could be really a good savior for your feet. Trench foot, um, this is of course more if you're constantly exposed to cold and wet conditions. Um, like if you're walking in a creek the whole time or things like that. Um, Winter time is not gonna happen as often with being completely um, exposed and drenched, but you just never know. Um, so this is more of that prolonged use of wet socks and shoes too. So really kind of dry them out. Those extra shoes could come in handy as well. I do see a lot of people when they go hiking, they bring an extra pair of shoes to switch out, um, just use their hiking boots and then switch to sneakers. Anything like that can help prevent even just cold, wet feet in general. So um, especially in the winter months, you just want to take that extra precaution. Um, best way to prevent it, those quality shoes and boots. Um, I have muck boots, so those are a little bit higher, um, a little bit thicker, and they're going to be more of a wet, um, walking in more wet conditions. Um, as long as you don't get holes in them, they are super effective in keeping your feet dry and pretty warm. Um, same with hiking boots. Usually a lot of people like to say the higher up the ankle it goes, the better, keep it tighter. It just keeps the whole shoe very, very dry overall. Um, change your socks anytime they get wet. 
Um, that could be with any clothing, honestly. Um, if you're wearing jeans and they get wet, those are going to be wet for the rest of the day. Um, so just keep be prepared for that. And then inspect your shoes before and after hikes. Check for holes or ripping soles or things like that. Um, a nice thing I've noticed, especially with wet shoes, um, best way to dry those shoes out quickly if you don't have a boot dryer um, is newspaper. So if you stuff your shoes in newspaper, it actually absorbs up that, um, that moisture very quickly. It's, it's a great little secret that I like to share. So I recommend that if you don't know. Um, and that is it. So any questions? Thank you, Nikki. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, let's hold, if there's any questions about winter safety, let's hold that for a moment. Um, mm -hmm. There were questions in the chat about um, treatment. So Carrie does have um, a few more slides to share about the treatment of HWA um, that she's gonna run through right now. And then we will take questions about the whole presentation after that. Hello, I just need one second and then I will be ready. Are there, do you guys wanna answer a few questions while I'm pulling this together? Oh, sure. Um, all right, so if, that does, if anyone has any questions, we can take a couple of minutes to answer them now while we're... Oh. I, um, I have a question about um, if we were actually like putting together kind of like a survey methods document, is there like a time limit you would have volunteers spend on like looking at each tree? Hmm. Yeah, so um, I would say look at a lot of times you can't reach a lot of branches so yeah you're grabbing whatever you can get and grab the branch flip it over look at the underside of the branch which is where okay. my hwa are going to be um and i would look at as many as you can reach on the branch and then do one or maybe two more and then move on like no more okay. than three or four minutes on a tree Gotcha. Okay, I just kind of wanted like a general idea because I wasn't sure like does it take a lot of searching because I haven't seen it in person yet. Um, so I didn't know like if it's going to take a lot or just maybe a few minutes or. So I think, it, I think just flipping it over and glancing isn't enough. Like okay, to get it down, probably get your your hands behind it, ideally with a dark glove because that helps with okay. contact. And look, look, you know, scan the branches because sometimes it's just one. Um, but if you find just one down in the lower canopy, that's probably all through the tree. So um, a lot of times by the time we find it down where we can reach, it's been in the in been in the canopy for a couple of years. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, and where was I? Any other questions? Um, I saw that you answered some in the chat, Carrie. Maybe I could just give like a little overview of the question and answer just if people didn't see that. Thank you. Um, so someone just mentioned that they, um, they know of an infestation they didn't see on the map. And so that is really important. Um, you know, if you know of one or you think you've seen it, definitely go back to that area, survey for it and put it into IMAP so that, you know, land managers can use the information to make decisions for hemlock um, conservation and forest management. Um, another question was if they, um, if the hemlock woolly adelgid wiggles in its woolly stage um, and they don't wiggle in the woolly stage. Um, <laughs> but the boogie woogie aphid does. Um, Very cool. I did <laughs> eat on this year at yeah. Chestnut Ridge. They're super and, cool. Um, so if you want to see a cool video or about those boogie woogies, um, you can access that at Erie County Parks, Facebook or Instagram. We put up a big video about it. Oh, nice. They were very cool. <laughs> it was the first time I'd seen them too. And I was like, they're so dancing. So yeah, the boogie woogies are very cool, but they are a little different than <laughs> the hamlet. Yeah. 
And I actually made a mistake in that answer there, an aphid, not an ethelgid, but they do have a yes. way that they move around. Okay, and then I think just the last one was how far up the hemlock tree are they found? And we kind of touched on that, that they are found throughout the canopy, um, but either grab the lower branches to look at, or um, even if um, twigs that have been blown down or dropped, um, you can look at those on the ground um, to get an idea of what might be going on yeah. up in the canopy. You can also look at the bark. Um, HWA doesn't grow on the bark, but hemlocks, like most trees, do funnel rainwater down so that down their bark and so when the the rain washes off little bits of the wool it can get caught on that craggy hemlock bark so that's another place to nice. so yeah definitely ways if you pit to the canopy that's not expected for these uh, surveys and i think yeah then the last question was just about treatment so there are two there's sort of a short-term response and a long-term response. And the short-term response is chemical treatment. It's really the only, it's the only game in town right now, um, particularly if you're looking at a forest tree. If you have a hemlock hedge, like short, something that you can spray the whole plant and it's not too hard and you can do it a few times a year, you can use horticultural oil, that'll work but you have to stay on top of it and it has to cover the whole plant, which is why that is kind of a non-starter for a forest tree, right? Because can you imagine standing there trying to do complete coverage of a 50 foot tall tree? So sy systemic insecticides are really the option in a forest setting. The long-term solution is biological control. So um, there are two chemicals you can use for HWA management in your forest stands. The first one is imidacloprid. Imidacloprid is a slow acting general insecticide. Um, it doesn't become effective until almost a full year after you apply it, but then it stays in the tree working for three to seven years, um, an average of about five years, but occasionally you get the full seven. Dinotefuran is another chemical that you can use. It works within a few weeks. It's up there killing your HWA, which is great, but it only lasts for a season. Um, in some, there are some situations where we recommend that you use both. Um, if you have a very big tree, a very mature tree, very mature trees um, move, move sap through their trunk fairly slowly and um, HWA damage damages that movement through through the trunk. And so you can get in a situation where you have an infested, very old tree that you can't get the chemical up into the branches to protect them because it's already been pretty damaged. And so if you have a really old tree, we would recommend monitoring it carefully and treating it with both of these so that you get that quick action and you also get the long um, protection from the imidacloprid. Uh, also really sick trees, it's good to use both just because they maybe they can't take another year of damage before that imidacloprid kicks in. Does that make sense? Um, imidacloprid you can buy and apply as a soil drench. Um, it is, there are a bunch of different kinds and we don't recommend one over another, but the, uh, the bayer tree and shrub is, is one that you can find in your, in your local Walmart or whatever. The dinotephrian can only be applied by, um, by professionals. And what we actually think is the best practice is to hire a professional to treat your trees because they can do this, which is basal bark application where they, they have a backpack sprayer and they spray just the trunk from like two feet to six feet um, all the way around. And then the, the chemical soaks through the trunk and moves up into the canopy. Uh, we like this because it's very targeted, right? When you, when you do a soil, a soil application, any plant that has its roots in that area is gonna pick up that chemical. And so you wind up with this general insecticide in other plants nearby instead of just your tree. Um, but it, it's effective, it's just not as targeted. Um, imidacloprid is 
neonicotinoid. Um, they are the most commonly used insecticide in the world. And the reason is that they replace the organophosphates, which were really, really toxic to people and mammals. Um, but they are a general broad spectrum insecticide. So they, they are under review by the state legislature right now to be banned for a lot of different uses in New York because they're, um, they're, there's some concern that they're contributing to the decline of our pollinators. Um, the reason that we think this is a good application is that hemlocks are wind pollinated. They don't produce any nectar at all. Their pollen is not of interest to pollinators. And so particularly if you use a targeted application method like the um, basal bark application, then you're making sure that that chemical is only going into the street and it's only affecting the insects on this tree. And um, because it's not producing any resources for pollinators, it shouldn't be an issue. It's also a much lower rate of application and only once every several years versus what goes into our agricultural fields all over the state. Um, when you think about, do I wanna do this treatment or not? It's important to remember that if you leave the HWA to do its thing, it's going to kill your hemlocks. Um, and those hemlocks, if you think back to earlier in the talk, they're providing all of these ecosystem services that are not readily replaced. Um, evergreens are not gonna replace these because they grow in places where ever, other evergreens don't grow. <laughs> and, um, and, and they provide a very different ecosystem from the broadleaf forest around them. And having that, you know, the different patches of forest is really important for the biodiversity of our region. And so when you're thinking about uh, the, the decision about whether or not to treat your trees, remember that you are weighing the potential risks of treatment against the potential risks of losing all of your hemlocks. And that is why um, we recommend treatment in this situation because we feel like the, the risks of the treatment are lower than the risks of losing your hemlock stands. The other option, the long-term solution, is really biological control because it's something that you, you know, re you release these the, the biological control, it reproduces out in the landscape and it um, keeps going, right? And it's also landscape scale, which is something we can never do. We can't treat all the hemlocks. They're the fourth most common tree in the state. So that's definitely not gonna happen. Um, and so the, the, the two long-term solutions are um, finding resistant hemlock trees, you know, growing a breeding line of hemlock resistant trees and planting them out in the landscape, which is cool, but we'll do nothing to save the trees on the landscape now. And also we haven't found those trees yet and we haven't identified any resistance yet. Um, the, the only other option that's that long-term sort of adapting the ecosystem is biological control. And so that's what we're really focused on at our lab. But the research is still underway. We're still trying to figure out what will work to, to we're hoping that the biological control will keep the HWA populations down enough that they don't kill our trees. You know, the HWA is never going away, but if we can make it so it's not a terminal issue for our hemlocks, that's fine. So the first one we have, we started working with was a Laracobius beetle. Uh, we like to call it Little Larry because it's easier to, to remember. Uh, this comes from the Pacific Northwest where you, if you remember in that map, there's HWA that's been in the Pacific Northwest for thousands and thousands of years. And so there are several predators out there that help keep it in check. This is one of the most common ones. Uh, we released a bunch of them um, and we've, we found establishedness in the last few years at seven of our release sites, which is really exciting. And they're mostly in the Finger Lakes region. Um, so this, this bug seems to be happiest in 6A and warmer. Um, so you have a decent chunk of your, of your area fits that bill. The other bug we're working with, which is a newer addition to our efforts is the Leucopus silverflies, 
And just to add complication, they just changed the name of the genus to Leucotaraxis. So we'll update this soon. Um, this is also from the Pacific Northwest, but this one speeds on the spring generation of HWA. And we think that what's really crucial is that we have predators that feed on both generations so that we nip back both of those opportunities for exponential growth. The, the eggs of HWA, we've released a bunch of them. The problem with finding these again is that they're flies and their larvae are borderline microscopic. Uh, so the only way to find them is to look with the dissecting scope. Um, unless you can develop an environmental DNA solution, which we're working on and hopefully we'll have results for you guys in the next year. So this is where we've released so far. Um, and another good incentive for searching in Western New York is we have very few, almost no, release sites in Western New York. Um, we need to, we need public land or protected, you know, properly protected forest with a strong HWA population, but still healthy trees with low hanging branches. Those are the four pieces that we need for a biocontrol site. So when you're out there looking, keep your eyes out for that set of conditions because that's what we need to release biocontrols in Western New York. That's it. Thank you, Carrie. Um, at this point, does anyone have any uh, further questions about any portion of the presentation? Um, I have one more quick question, not really about HWA, but um, you mentioned earlier that porcupines um, are like feeding on the hemlock trees. What parts of the state do you like, will you find porcupines? I haven't seen one yet. <laughs> I've never seen one either, but I've been told that they really, really love to hang out on, on hemlocks in the winter up in the canopy, nibbling on one presumes the twigs and then dropping the ends. Okay. And why we all I've seen mice. I've seen evidence of it here at Chestnut Ridge. Um, they like to eat the bark of a lot of other trees as well. Um, again, I haven't seen one yet, but they do exist. Um, they're more of a nocturnal and really high up in the tree type of um, animals. So, but they, they are around, they're just very secretive. <laughs> and is that Chestnut Ridge like in, that's in um, uh, Orchard Park? Yep. Okay. Yeah, I really want to see one. We live in Chictawaga, mm -hmm. but I don't know if they're, I guess if they're at Orchard Park, they're close. Oh yeah, they're, they're around. Um, anytime you kind of see like any kind of bark, bare bark that has fallen off, of, of a tree that looks very living. Um, that's probably a porcupine eating, eating all of that up. So they're around at the, like I said, I've never seen one yet either. So okay. one, you just gotta keep your eye out. You never know. <laughs> yeah, I wanna see one so bad. I'm excited. I'm hoping that on one of our hikes this winter, we'll see one. <laughs> you never know. I Thank dropped, you. I dropped a link in with a, with a map for the distribution of porcupine. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Mary, did you see one in the cemetery? <laughs> yes, years ago. Um, it was very common. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so oh no, so and I and I actually miss them. I miss them horribly. Um, <laughs> but you know the Pine Ridge, Genesee, Egger, you know that whole mm -hmm. area where what was it? American, uh, forget the name of the company. It's defunct now. But um, so near that um, cemetery, there used to be plenty of them in there. Mm -hmm. I just haven't been in that cemetery recently, so <laughs> I don't know. That's amazing. Thank you. Thank you guys for your interest in hemlock conservation and your willingness to get out and, and do some surveys to try to help us figure out um, how best to manage our hemlock. We're really grateful. Yeah. I wanted to mention too, um, 
that we compiled a list of parks by county where there's data gaps. So um, I'm gonna be emailing that to all of the participants. So we're all gonna get together next Saturday at Chestnut Ridge and we'll take a walk around and we'll see um, what a hemlock willy adelgid um, infestation looks like so everybody will know. Um, and then we can also identify the hemlocks in the field as well. And then I will email that list around and feel free to go around your county and go to some of these parks, follow you know safety winter safety hiking tips and um, do some reporting on IMAP um, we would absolutely love that because like we were saying earlier, like Carrie showed us that map, um, there's that whole snake down in the southern tier where we don't know. Um, it has areas that haven't been surveyed. And uh, then there are a couple of um, parks up along Lake Ontario that haven't been surveyed either. So it would be incredibly helpful for us to do our work um, to have you know, community scientists like you guys out there collecting the data. Does anyone have any questions about um, what to bring or where to meet next week at Chestnut Ridge? Other than um, just downloading the app, do are there other things that we should bring, like other than just like paper and writing materials? Um, yeah, I think the big thing would just be trying to yeah make the IMAP Invasives account, put the app on a phone or a tablet, and just log in at home so it's all set to go in the field. Because um, there are just some things you need to do when you're connected to Wi-Fi. And then, yeah, just the, you know, the winter essentials that were mentioned, because we are going to be outside for the survey part. Um, Thank you. Thank you for answering my question about the Oogie Woogies because I did see them um, in East Aurora and I was curious as to what they were. They're really cool. <laughs> I was just wondering like, where would we be meeting in Chestnut Ridge? Um, we're gonna meet um, right at the, probably right outside of the casino. Oh. Um, like by the, the sledding hills, they're sledding, um, the toboggan sledding area that's there. Um, okay, thank you. I'm gonna send around a, an email um, with the address and driving directions. Um, I will also put both my phone number and Brittany's phone number in the email. So if you get lost once you get to the park, feel free to give us a call and we can help direct you to uh, where we're gonna be. And we're gonna meet at 10 a.m. Yeah. And then our thought is after we, you know, do our survey, look at the HW, everything, um, if people wanted to, like Cecilia mentioned, take a look at the list of parks that we don't have any data on, but also if people wanted to, if they felt comfortable, if they want to plan to survey together, you know, if you don't feel comfortable going out by yourself, it's a way for us to, you know, to network and maybe partner up or something like that as well to get out there and do the survey work. Thank you so much. Um, well, if there are no other questions, um, I just want to thank Ranger Nikki and Carrie and Brittany so much for being here today. And um, thank you to everyone who came to participate and learn about HWA. And we are really looking forward to seeing everyone in person next week at Chestnut Ridge. <laughs>